the European Commission are proposing a new funding programme for 2021-2027. It's a big debate on the budget, proving quite difficult. What would you say to the European Commission and indeed to the member states? We would say let's use this money to make asylum function in Europe. So we would like to see the funding used to support uh, asylum systems, to make sure that member states comply with their legal obligations under EU asylum law. We would like to see money used for integration to make sure that people are included through rights and respect in European societies. The second point, I think, is about who gets the money. The previous funding for asylum and mi migration went primarily to, set to and through central governments. Here we are arguing that a greater chunk of the money should go to local authorities and to civil society because these are the actors that actually support uh, asylum and migration within Europe and in some cases central governments are not the most supportive. I've certainly heard this complaint from uh, Greek people who have said that they are not seeing the money, it's going through international organisations. They want more of a role. Uh, do you think there is the capacity out there in the local authorities, in civil society, to, to deal with this? Well, we have 105 member organisations in 40 European countries, and our conclusion is that in every country the capacity is there. It's just a matter of channeling the funds to the right people. Um, in some cases, they may be organisations that are led by people with a migrant or refugee background themselves, who have a crucial role to play in inclusion, but also in the political debate on this issue. In other cases, it might be organisations that are demonstrating solidarity, that are supporting the implementation of EU asylum law, for instance, providing legal assistance to people arriving, and in the more difficult circumstances, those providing humanitarian assistance to deal with the consequences of some of the negative policies that we see. So we see the capacity, it's just a question of getting simple, flexible funding that these organisations can manage into their hands. We wanted to look specifically at how far the funding that's designed to incentivise member state participation in these activities, how far it has done that. And the related questions, of course, is how, are the fun how was the funding used and what was the impact? Um, so I think what we found is that the funding had been used in, to really finance and, and, and resettlement, uh, to finance and expansion of resettlement across member states. Um, very different ways of implementing that funding at national level. Um, but the way the funding is structured in that member states don't have the same level of reporting and monitoring requirements as other EU funds, that had really promoted a lot of quality and a lot of good practice. Um, in relation to relocation, we found that there were lots of obstacles and challenges to relocation that funding couldn't by itself address, um, also for, for resettlement to a degree. Um, what we found, though, is that the funding has operationalised solidarity across member states. We would like to see a more even participation of member states um, in these activities, but nonetheless the fund has supported a lot of good work in these areas. And have you been able to identify European leaders, examples that you could hold up as best practice in your report, or is it just a broad look across the piece? It's a broad look across the piece and also supplemented by national case studies. So uh, w there I wouldn't necessarily want to identify European leaders because we haven't looked at every member state in detail. Um, we could point to, to areas of good practice, I think, in all of our case study member states. Um, so we heard at the event today, particularly from France, um, who have massively expanded their resettlement, entirely financed by EU money, and have a, a very creative way of programming the fund to make their programs responsive to global resettlement needs. And also their programs are responsive to the needs of those people that are arriving. So they change what they're doing according to the predominant needs of a particular refugee group. Um, I think also we would point to the efforts of a small country with less resources, I would say, like Portugal, um, who is a very enthusiastic participant in relocation and solidarity in that context and has carried forward that momentum into resettlement with a really, really strong commitment to the humanitarian nature of, of, of resettlement. Um, and a very strong commitment also to kind of expanding that solidarity across lots of different sectors of society. So everyone from churches to citizens groups to municipalities and so on are involved in the program now. Looking forward, uh, the European Commission, the member states are negotiating the, the next program. Is there anything that you would highlight that they should consider um, for the next program? Maybe something that they haven't covered adequately or maybe um, a distribution uh, uh, re 
redistribution of how the money is spent and what, what should the main priority be? Well, if we talk about the structure of the fund, which is what Sandra's discussing at the moment, um, quite apart from the financial allocations to the fund, so we would say that we would prefer to see a dedicated budget line for resettlement. It's a core part of policy. It has been ever since the European agenda on migration. And at the moment, resettlement, as the new fund is proposed to be structured, is in with a lot of other things. There's a global allocation of a, a significant amount of money, but nonetheless, there's not a reliable source of funding for resettlement throughout the funding period. Um, so civil society have been working very hard to have member states commit to their involvement in, re in resettlement across a long period and for the European Resettlement Offer to increase exponentially. Um, to 2030, we'd like to see 100,000 places in Europe. Um, so for this to happen, to be made a reality, we think we need a dedicated, reliable, sustainable source of funding for resettlement. In relation to, to, <coughs> to relocation, which is about internal responsibility sharing, uh, we would like to see there that solidarity is in the objectives of the fund, which it currently isn't as it's proposed, um, and that a certain proportion of money is ring-fenced to implement solidarity measures. And do you think that the revision of the Migration Pact, potential, hopeful, maybe, <laughs> a review of Dublin, uh, the Dublin regulation, uh, is also important in relation to the use of the fund? It's certainly important. I mean, it sets the policy context. I think the key issue here is timing and um, practicality. So at the moment, the fund is, is due, ideally, to be in place by the beginning of next year. And we already saw the really strong impact that the delay in the implementation or the adoption of the AMIF for the 2014-20 period that had a really significant impact in a lot of different areas. The country didn't get going with the fund until at least mid-2015, if not into 2016. So a significant period of the, of the fund was missed, you know, in terms of funding being available. So I think, okay, the, the PACT sets the policy framework. We can't wait for the PACT, and we certainly can't wait for Dublin reform um, to, in order to organise the fund and to get going with that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would... The pact particularly offers uh, quite some promising aspects in relation to resettlement particularly. Um, but the fund needs to go ahead and it needs to be agreed in order to be implemented at the start of 2021. Otherwise, we'll see the same situation as we have had with the AMIF arriving again.